I'm Kirk Evans, Principal of Premier Field Engineer with Microsoft. In this section, we'll look at making cross-domain calls with SharePoint 2013. As web applications grow in popularity, web developers have become more aware of a significant limitation. Browsers do not allow page elements to interact with more than one domain. Allowing such interactions would expose both users and servers to cross-domain attacks. Now, in a cross-domain attack, you convince someone to enter data that a user expects is being used for the intended purpose, but instead, the data is sent to another domain for purposes other than what the user may have intended. Now, the simplest way to prevent against this type of attack, a cross-domain attack, is to simply not allow the interaction with more than the domain from which the data was served. But nevertheless, modern apps incorporate information from several different data sources that will most likely reside in different domains. It's common to bring data from different domains to create things like mashups. So by using the cross-domain library in SharePoint 2013, you can incorporate information from SharePoint to your apps that reside in a different domain to improve the functionality of your app. The solution for interacting with SharePoint data from the browser is to use the cross-domain library. This library includes some features to help you avoid the common risks of cross-domain attacks. The cross-domain library includes several elements to make this interaction safe and possible. SharePoint provides a JavaScript library that takes care of making secure cross-domain calls to SharePoint. Underneath the covers, the library uses a hidden iframe along with post messaging and a proxy page to route calls to SharePoint. Routing happens client-side as opposed to server-side, so this is an all-client-side solution. When we're communicating across domains in this manner, we have to register the specific domains in our app that are trusted to make these calls, and we rely on the user installing the app to provide specific permission trusting our app. In this slide, we see how a user trusts the app to read data from the site. There is additional registration that we'll need to do within the app to make this work, as we'll see in the demo in just a moment. So let's look at the mechanics of how this all works. AppWebProxy.aspx is a web page built with ASP.NET and it is located in the Layouts folder of the SharePoint site. This ensures every SharePoint web has access to the page because it's in the Layouts folder, so it's a well-known page for every app to start the process of making a cross-domain call. The proxy page is responsible for forwarding the calls to the underlying SharePoint infrastructure. This well-known page will be called from the remote domain. The JavaScript library, sp.requestexecutor.js, is the library required to make the cross-domain call. It resides in the layouts directory, but you can copy this file to your app for distribution if you want. And to be able to use the cross-domain library, you have to provide a reference to the resource file, sp.requestexecutor.js. You can use a simple script tag to do this and then you initialize the library with the SharePoint app URL. Now at this point the library creates an iframe in the remote page that references the appwebproxy.aspx page. The remote web server page has an iframe in it and within that iframe is the appwebproxy.aspx page. The proxy page source domain is the SharePoint web so calls are restricted to the permissions that are granted to the app. Communication is set to only allow point-to-point -point calls. SharePoint serves only those requests that come from the registered trusted domain. When the iframe receives a response, it makes sure that it comes from the SharePoint domain, otherwise it will be ignored. You can use both REST and the JavaScript client-side object model, the CSOM, to interact with the SharePoint lists and libraries. If you use REST, you will use the request executor object to access the supported verbs. If you use the JavaScript client-side object model, you will use the client context object to access SharePoint objects. These calls cross the iframe and the actual call is made by appwebproxy.aspx. As mentioned before, when the JavaScript is initialized, 
It creates a hidden iframe in the external app page. The iframe loads the proxy page, and this mechanism allows communication between the cross-domain library and the iframe. This in turn forwards the messages onto the proxy. In this demonstration, we'll take a look at using the cross-domain library to query a, an app web for a SharePoint hosted app, but we'll query it from a remote web that's not on the same domain. And this can be useful when you have a remote web application that needs to get data from your SharePoint hosted app. So to start with, let's inspect our project solution here. So we have a list called announcements. If we open that up, we can see the list designer has the different uh, columns, views, and the list. The list is announcements, and the list URL is list slash announcements. And if we view the code, we'll be able to see in the element manifest that there's actually a list instance element defined that provides the announcements, the template type, the URL. There's also some data that we've pre-populated this list with. And this is just, a, again, a list of announcements, such as that there will be a server outage next Tuesday, company daycare will be closed on Monday, um, volunteer day is next Wednesday. So you get the point. There's just some pre-populated data. Recall, though, that when we deploy a list as part of a SharePoint-hosted uh, app, that that list will become a part of the app web. So it's deployed into the app web. And now, since we have this list, now let's take a look at the app manifest. And if we go into the app manifest, we see some familiar properties, such as the title and start page, but also the app principle. Now, the app principle here is internal, but we add an additional attribute called allowed remote host URL. And that tells it that th here's the allowed remote host URL that's allowed to use the cross-domain library for communication. Another interesting thing here is that the start page does not point to a page inside our app web. Instead, it's pointing to a page that is outside the app web, and it's actually in a remote web. So this remote web will make a cross-domain call back into the app web to be able to query data from that announcements list. So we're simply going to point to a page, which is this cross-domain call CSUM, in order to, to make that call. Another interesting change here is that typically when we create a SharePoint hosted app, we don't have to add a permission request in order to read data from that app web. Typically the app has full control to the app web. Well here, we have to add a, an app permission request to be able to read from the web. And the reason why is because the code that will read from the app web is remote. It's not inside the app web itself. Uh, some of the moving parts here that we'll need to understand is first, the start page will go to a remote web. We need to set the allowed remote host URL in order to work with the cross domain library. And we'll also need to add a permission request for that remote code to be able to read from the app web. Now that we've kind of inspected that, let's take a look at the actual code that we'll start with this cross domain call csum.html. If we open that page, we can see that we've referenced a few scripts such as Microsoft Ajax, the SP Runtime, SP Request Executor, and SPJS. SP Request Executor, this is actually the cross domain library implementation. So we reference this SP Request Executor script in order to work with the cross domain library. Next is we'll use an immediate function here, and the immediate function will inform the app web URL, and it uses a function decode URI component, passing in the results of a call to a function called get query string parameter. And what we're doing is we're looking for a query string parameter called SP app web URL, decoding that and then storing that inside this variable app web URL. If we take a look at get query string parameter real quick. It's actually fairly, fairly simple. Get query string parameter simply splits the URL based on the question mark to be able to get the list of the name value key pairs and then splits each one of the name value key pairs by an ampersand. 
We then iterate through all of the different name value key pairs that were separated by ampersands previously. And then each one of those will be in the form of name equals value. So we'll simply split on that equal sign and then grab the information on the left or the key to be able to indicate if the key that was sent in is equal to the value that we're looking for. And if it is, then we grab the item with the index of one, which is the actual value. So this would represent the key and this would represent the value parameter. So once we iterate through, we find the parameter that we're looking for and then simply grab its value. Scroll back up and now we can see that all we're really doing is getting the getting the app web URL, decoding it, and then storing it inside this variable. Next is we'll use the client side object model. So we'll use the ECMAScript client side object model, SP client context, and we'll pass in the app web URL. Then we'll use the cross domain library, SP proxy web request executor factory, and then we'll pass in the app web URL. And this factory object will allow us to be able to create a new factory object that's used to set the web request executor factory on the context itself. So we obtain the factory, then after that we set the web request factory on the context itself. So this actually allows an interesting behavior where by using this library, we actually go to the uh, to the SharePoint web and then we'll pull back a page and that page will be embedded inside our app in an iframe and that's exactly what these lines of code are telling um, the client side object model is to embed that iframe and use that for the communication in order to cross the domains between the local uh, the local web and that remote web that we have which is which contains the SharePoint data once we've set up the web request executor factory and we set that on the context, then we use normal client side object model code to be able to set up the, the web, to get the web off the context, get a list by its display name or its title, which would be the announcements list. Then after that, we use uh, camel in order to query based on the view fields. And then we set the view XML and then we get the items for the list. Once we have that, we use context.load to load all announcements, and we don't want all of the properties. We simply just want the title and the body. Finally, we execute the query asynchronously, and then the success handler we'll use to create a delegate, and we'll also create a delegate to the error handler as well. So if we scroll down a bit, we can see the success handler, when it is called, will use the get enumerator in the client side object model and then while move next returns true, then we'll simply get the enumerator, we'll get the value of the title item, and for the current item, we'll get the body field as well. And then finally, we'll form all that up in a string, get the element by ID called render announcements, and set its inner HTML to be the result of what we just formed here. So we're just enumerating through the results, forming up some HTML and then setting it to be the inner HTML of this element. Should an error occur, then we'll get an error that says could not complete cross domain call with the reason why. So using the client side object model with the cross domain library is actually fairly straightforward. So let's hit F5 and Visual Studio then uploads, installs, and then launches Internet Explorer and attaches the debugger to the page. And because we had to ask for a permission in order to trust it, we can see that it asks us, do we trust the cross-domain app? And we'll say we do in fact trust it. And there's the result of our, of our call. Now, another interesting thing to note here is that if we go to the, if we go to F12 and we look at the developer tools and we start to expand and we look inside the body, we'll see, in fact, there is an iframe and the iframe has, has an ID as well as has a, has its source. So let's copy that and open up in notepad. And we can see, in fact, it is pointing to appwebproxy.aspx.
And it's that app web proxy that provides the implementation of the cross domain library such that we're able to embed that as an iframe, enabling us to cross the domain from, from our remote web into the, uh, into the domain of the app web. So that was an, a quick example of using the, that with client side object model. The next thing we'll want to do is let's set up using Rust. So if we open up uh, our REST example, here again, we've set a reference to Microsoft Ajax and the SP request executor, which is the implementation of the cross domain library. We use the same technique to get the app web URL, and then we set up a request executor object. Previously, when we use the factory, we're using the factory in conjunction with the client context and the client side object model. Well, here we're not using the client side object model. Instead, we're going to use a RESTful call. So we can simply set the request executor and then passing in the app web URL. Once we have the executor, we can tell it to execute async and then provide some properties that we want to use with the cross domain library. We tell it what's the URL, and the URL will be the app web URL plus the RESTful endpoint underscore API. Then we want to access the web, its lists, and then from its list, we want to get a list by its title, announcements, and we want to get the items in that list. We'll use the HTTP verb get, and the headers that we'll use. We'll need to tell it that the result should be JavaScript object notation, or JSON. In order to do that, um, the default is XML, but if we want JSON data back, we simply provide the accept header using the value application JSON o data equals verbose. Finally, when the call is successful, it will call our success handler. We parse the data, and then after that, once we have the data returned, the data will have an outer.d element. So we'll need to dereference that to be able to get the actual collection of results. Once we have the collection of results, we can iterate through and then form an HTML string using the title and body properties. Finally, we'll look for the element with the ID of render announcements and set its inner HTML to that value that we just created a moment ago. So let's again run our example. Visual Studio install uploads and installs our app, launches Internet Explorer. We're prompted, do we trust it? In fact, we do. And this time we'll change the URL. Instead of using cross domain call CSUM, we'll do cross domain call REST. And we'll see that the call is exactly the same, that we get the exact same results. But if we do F12, we'll be able to see that, in fact, it is the RESTful endpoint. And further, we'll be able to look inside the body and we'll see again, there is the iframe that we were using a moment ago. This was an example of how to use the cross domain library with the client side object model and REST. And further, we're able to see how the implementation behind the scenes creates this hidden iframe that takes the page that provides the cross domain library implementation, appwebproxy.aspx, embeds that as an iframe in our in the page for our remote web enabling us to call back into the app web for a SharePoint hosted project. In this section we looked at how we can use the sp.requestexecutor.js library and how it uses the app web proxy.aspx page to create an iframe in the remote web allowing cross domain calls between our remote web into the SharePoint site. And again, the sp.requestexecutor.js library provides a client-side solution for making cross-domain calls in the browser.